Well, I am delighted to say that uh, joining me on the Godcast this week is Jason Romana. Now, Jason uh, may not be ultra familiar to people in the UK, but he's a successful author. He's a speaker and media professional from America. He's had over 25 years of broadcasting and uh, media experience. So, Jason, it's really wonderful to get you on the Godcast. First of all, whereabouts are you in, in America yeah, uh, it's wonderful to be here. I am in Bristol, Connecticut, so probably two hours a little northeast of New York City to give people kind of a, a place on the map. Central yeah. Connecticut. And, and what is that a hotbed of sport for? Jason is an experienced sports uh, media professional. What, what's kind of what goes down there in Bristol over there? Well, they have a little media company called ESPN, uh, which I'm sure even those in the UK would have heard of and know about. Uh, so ESPN, you know, when they were creating their company back in 1979, they settled on Bristol, Connecticut, uh, here right where I live, probably 10 minutes from where I am right now, uh, to begin broadcasting. And the reason was because it was kind of in between Boston and in between New York City. And so it gave you a close proximity to two pretty big sports towns, but it was founded by a guy who lived in that area and they were looking for wide open spaces to be able to build on. It's hard to find that in larger cities. So ESPN settled in Bristol, Connecticut because they've been able to build out this, this campus, this compound um, to obviously now it's been 44 years to be able to broadcast and become one of the biggest media companies in the world and the biggest sports media company maybe ever. Yeah, and, and and your your pathway to media, Jason, was that something that you wanted to do from childhood? You know, did you go through university to to specialize in that area? Yeah, I did. When I was a kid, especially when my my childhood, you know, I kind of joke that when I was born, you know, I was born out of the womb uh, to watch sports. Uh, that's all I cared about as a kid. Uh, I wasn't a very religious kid or you know, spiritual growing up. I went to church here and there, but sports, if sports was my cathedral, sports was my God, sports was what I worshiped. And, um, you know, I, I look back now and I think, okay, that was probably a little misguided, but I'm thankful because I believe God gave me that passion for sports for a reason. And it allowed me to, you know, like you say, go into the university, go to college and, and uh, study journalism, study broadcasting. Uh, I, when I realized that I couldn't play sports, uh, Alex, uh, you know, professionally, the next best thing to me was to talk about it and to go into that world of, of broadcasting and media. And that's what I did. And I, I picked a couple of local colleges here in, in New York State, uh, outside of Connecticut. I grew up in, in upstate New York, Albany, New York, which is about two hours north of New York City. Uh, I grew up there, and um, so I went to a couple colleges that were in that area that had, you know, pretty good media programs, broadcasting programs, and uh, I was fortunate, you know, when I got out of college uh, many years ago, uh, I was able to get a job in local radio uh, for three years before I, I ended up at ESPN. Local radio, even in, in the UK, is a great gateway, isn't it, into into uh, the world of media? Just Just a few recollections of of that time of your life, Jason? I love that time of my life for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, it was the most fun still to this day. This is 20, 26 years ago, 25 years ago. Still to, the mo to, to this day, it's the most fun I've ever had uh, in broadcasting because you know I was young. I was 23, 24 years old, um, just starting out, trying to find my way just happy that somebody was actually paying me some some amount of money to be able to do what I dreamed about doing and it wasn't sports you know it was it was kind of a local uh I don't know what you call it like a news magazine type morning show that I was working on so we would cover all the local events and you know travel to some of the local events and there was a little politics in there a little news item you know fun entertainment and a little sports as well. Um, but I had so much fun. And the guy that I was working with at the time, he's now since passed. His name is Don Weeks. He was a local legend, which I'm sure anywhere around the world, if you have local radio, there's these guys that, you know, you grow up listening to. They're the voices of your childhood, the voices that you listen to every day. And he was that guy for so many. And so for me to be able to work with him uh, for two years was the greatest 
uh, classes of, of media I could ever have, you know, forget going to college, working with this guy taught me so much about the business of broadcasting and media. He taught me to have fun and not to take ourselves too seriously. But he also taught me how how to live life and to understand that, you know, life is short and to, to do the best that you can. Now, at that time, my spiritual life was not there. Uh, you know, I wasn't a follower of Jesus or, or kind of walking in, in faith at all at that time. But those were all kind of things I think God was planting seeds at that time of just preparing me. Um, and those early days were so much fun. I mean, we would come on the radio every morning and just laugh our butts off. And it was so much fun. Um, so I, I missed those times because it was, you know, many years ago and certainly to be younger would have been, you know, it's, it's always a, a fun time of life. But, you know, at that time, I was just starting to date my wife, my now wife at that time. Um, we didn't have kids yet. You know, I was just trying to, you know, make enough money to be able to live on my own apartment. You know, I mean, it was just different times than where we are now. Uh, but I'm so grateful for those early years, for sure. You, you just touched on uh, your own faith and not being quite there, but you, you, you mentioned some of the seeds. What what were the seeds, Jason? Um, I think the seeds were, you know, it's funny. They weren't seeds of faith. I think they were seeds of of trying to be, you know, as good a person as I could be, trying to understand that there were bigger things in life than just my job. You know, it's, these are small seeds that now, as a, as a devout follower of Jesus who, who, you know, read the Bible and studied the Bible and walked with the Lord for 20 years, now I see this is all part of God's plan. So I wouldn't say that he was planting seeds of, um, you know, scripture or anything like that uh, in me. Um, I think my brother Chris was, which we can get into that in a little bit. But I think from work perspective, it was just trying to how to carry yourself, you know, maturing. Uh, New Testament talks about, you know, spiritual milk that we crave and we're not kids anymore. Uh, you know, we're, we're adults, you know, in the sense of being followers of Christ, more mature in our faith. I think I was just learning how to be more mature as a human being during that time. Uh, you know, 23 years old. Um, I was around a guy who once told me, Alex, you'll like this quote. He said, everybody gets old, but you can remain immature forever. <laughs> and so this is a guy who also, when I said he talked, he taught me how to laugh and not take myself too seriously. Uh, now that I'm going to be 50 years old in about a month, I can, I can attest to being older, but also understanding that I'm not trying to be immature per se, but I'm trying to like laugh and have fun and understand that life is short. Yeah. And if we take it too seriously, I think it's going to, it's going to backfire a little I bit. I think so. it's a great, it's a great quote. You know, I've recently turned 54 and, you know, I'm, I'm being a Anglican priest. There's a level of expectation from the clergy <laughs> and yes. from the congregations, but, I, but, I, but I think I'm quite immature at heart. And sometimes I need, <laughs> I need to be reminded of that because it does bring out, it brings out uh, a good side of me uh, that I enjoy myself to to participate in, you know. So yeah, well, Jesus talks about a childlike faith, right? Like that we're really all supposed to pro approach Him in many ways like a child, and I think there is truth to that because children are immature and they're, you know, uh, you know, silly and fun and goofy and all those things. And I think if you know, obviously, our faith is serious, something we're supposed to take seriously. But I think there is a child within all of us, whatever age we get to, that we still yearn to kind of revisit every so often. Uh, so I know that for me, uh, yeah. I try to do that. I, t I totally agree. I think I think sometimes I, I sometimes remind people that, you know, that that, that God gave us the gift of humor, the, the gift of a sense of fun. And sometimes we underestimate that, particularly as we come out of COVID and all the horrible experience of that. I think it's really That's important to, re to remember and reiterate to people. I, I could not agree more. I think it's so important to remember where you came from. It's important to remember what, what was that like when you were nine years old? Yeah. And what brought you the most joy? And to revisit that a little bit as you get older. Yeah. Um, you know, I, you being in the UK, one of my, my favorite joys that has nothing to do with Jesus or Christianity, but I love the Beatles. And so whenever I hear the Beatles, they bring me joy. I listen to them a lot and they bring me joy, but it reminds me of being younger 
and being at my house with my dad who would play Sergeant Peppers and, and there's the music and it's like, okay, that takes me back yeah. to those moments. So I think there's nothing wrong with that. I think God births that within us. And I think we need to, again, not take ourselves too seriously in those moments. And it's okay to go back and, you know, be a little kid again every so often. Yeah. Now this, this period working in local radio, did you, did you th- see, uh, the great lights of ESPN on the horizon. Were you, were you was this the game plan? Was this in, intentional? How, just tell us how that all came about. Because was it over 20, 25 years you worked for the for the organization? Is that right? Well, seventeen at ESPN, yeah. but twenty five years in in broadcasting. Right, but yeah. Still a long time. Yeah. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't on the radar. I, I mean, if you talked to me or met me when I was sixteen years old, I would have told you I want to be a sports broadcaster. In fact, my my yearbook in high school, they have quotes for you know your senior year, and the quote in my yearbook said, uh, "Class of 1991, Jason Romano," and then the quote, uh, "To be the greatest sports broadcaster since Howard Cosell, who was a very famous broadcaster in the 70s and 60s uh, in the United States, even even into the early 80s." So my mindset was always like, "Wouldn't that be the coolest thing to be an amazing broadcaster at that level?" But I don't think I really dreamed or even had in the game plan to go to ESPN because when I, when I got out of college, I just wanted a job in broadcasting and I was so grateful. It took me about four months after I graduated to get that job in local radio. It was WGY radio in Albany, New York. I don't think I mentioned the call letters. So at WGY, if you'd have told me at that time that I would have just worked there forever and spent 30 years at that station, I don't think I would have complained. I I would probably have said, yeah, that that's amazing. Um, Did I have this yearning to do sports? Yes, that was for sure. But I think even when you're, I, I liken it to sports, right? Like if you're a baseball player and you grow up and you root for your favorite baseball team and you play little league baseball, like kids baseball, right? Youth baseball. And you're dreaming about being in the big leagues and being the next great baseball player. That's normal. Like that's kind of where I was with broadcasting. Like it'd be great to, but you real realistically, it's probably not going to happen, but that dream is always kind of there. And so for me, realistically, I just thought, okay, I can probably get a job in local radio. Maybe I could go into local television or something. Maybe I can do some local sports. But ESPN was not in the plans or the cards. It actually came about, Alex, by just the early days of the internet. This is the late 90s. I think actually this was early 2000, the first year, 2000, um, March or, of eight, or April of 2000. I saw a job listing on the internet for an ESPN radio producer job. And I looked at it and I said, okay, first of all, that's ESPN. That's amazing. Second of all, it's producing. That's what I've been doing for three years. Uh, And third of all, it's a job opening uh, that requires, at least on paper, that I have five years of broadcasting experience. I only had three. They're looking for five years of network experience. I only had three years of local experience. But the, the knucklehead, I guess, in me just didn't care about that and went right to the internet and said, I'm going to apply for this job. Why not? And I applied for it, um, not thinking that I would get it, not even thinking that I'd get a call, but just thinking, why not? What's the worst that could happen? Nobody calls me back. I love the job I'm doing now. Here we go. Well, I remember going home to my, my wife, who we had just gotten married a few months earlier. And I said, Hey, I just want you to know that I applied for a job at ESPN today. Um, they're probably going to call. I'm probably going to say yes. And we're probably going to have to move to Connecticut. But I said that jokingly, Alex, there's no way I really believe that. And she just looked at me with this bizarre face and said, what are you talking about? I said, well, you know, ESPN job popped up on the internet and I applied for it. I don't think I'm going to get it, but I just want you to know that I applied for it. And we kind of just filed it in the back of our minds for about a month and a half. And then they called. Couldn't believe it. Hey, he's at ESPN. Hey, Jason, we want you to come out to Bristol, Connecticut and interview for the job. And I went out and I got the job and we moved to Connecticut. And uh, that was in July. My first day was July 18th, 2000. And when I got there, Alex, it was like 
you know, we talked about that childlike faith. It was like being a 10 year old all over again. And it was great. And I walked in there and I said, I can't believe I'm watching and seeing and working with my heroes in many ways. The people I watch at ES on ESPN, I've watched since I was a kid. Uh, so yeah, it was like that. And for most of my 17 years there, it was like that. Like it was going in every day and saying, I can't believe I get to do this job at yeah. this place. It was pretty cool. I, well, you're answering my next question because I was going to say, was the was the dream, uh, uh, was the reality as good as the dream? And it well, sounds like it was. What, what were the highlights? Yeah, for the most part, the reality was as good as the dream. I mean, at the same time, in fact, I would say it actually exceeded any kind of dreams that I had because working at a place is one thing, but interacting with the people who I watched became, I keep, I became friends with the people that I watched. I became friends with people who I idolized and rooted for in sports as a kid, my, my sports heroes, um, which is just crazy. So my highlights, I mean, the first one, it's not really a highlight, but it's a memorable moment was just working on nine 11, uh, which was a, you know, a day, you know, here in the States that everybody knows about in 2001. And I had only been at ESPN for about a year or so. And then this monumental moment happens. And I think you just think back to where you were, what you were doing at that time, but then thinking about your job. And, you know, we didn't go on the air on September 11th because all of ESPN's programming was shut off just so that we could cover this, you know, this horrific event that took place. But the next day we went on the air, September 12th, 2001. And that's a day I'll always remember because it was the first day of broadcasting any kind of sports news after this moment that affects the entire world, not just the United States. And, um, you know, I just remember thinking how, you know, this was sort of a baptism by fire. Nobody really knew what they were doing and they kind of threw us in and said, okay, just try to be as tasteful and as tactful and as sensitive and empathetic as you can in how you cover this event. And all we did was we just talked to sports people about their feelings on the event. So we didn't talk sports. We just had the, the voices that you normally would hear at ESPN come on and talk about their own feelings, their own thoughts, their own reactions, where they were. Um, it was surreal. It was a very surreal day. You know, there were many other great moments I've gotten to cover, uh, you know, large events in the American, you know, lexicon of sports, like the Super Bowl, like the World Series, like the NBA Finals, and just going and being at these events. Um, you know, you talk about, childhood you know dreams like for people to pay me to go to these events and cover them uh you know i would pay lots of money on my own to go to these events and cover them and i'm being paid so there's 17 years there's so many memories i think that september 12th 2001 yeah. kind of stands out as one i don't talk a lot about but it's definitely a memorable one and where were you uh, and so as your career evolves where tell us about how your faith evolves as well jason and which ultimately leads you to leaving ESPN, doesn't it? Just just take us through that that cycle, if you would. Yeah, so I grew up going to St. Patrick's Catholic Church in, in Ravenna, New York, which is a small town uh, near Albany, a couple hours north of New York City. But I didn't really pay attention. Uh, I didn't care about church. Uh, my grandfather took me. So if you want to talk about seed, seed planting, that was certainly a moment when I was a, a young boy uh, going to church with my grandfather. Um, but fast forward, once I became, you know, in my teenage years and adolescent years, I kind of just decided I don't want to have anything to do with church or God. I, not even, I wasn't anti-God. I just didn't care. You know, like I said, my sports and uh, fandom of sports, that was my God. And that's what I worshiped. But in 2001, um, thanks to my brother, Chris, uh, who was the first in our family to really get serious about his faith in, in Jesus, he invited me to his church. And it was a different type of church. It was a, if you know, uh, Father Alex, about the Pentecostal world, uh, a denomination, it was a very charismatic, energetic church, much different than what I grew to know and see. And I was definitely out of place when I walked in there. Yeah. Uh, but I said yes, because it was Mother's Day and my mom was in town and my brothers were going. So we all kind of just went to my brother's church. 
And, you know, the singing and the clapping and the music, that was a little different for me. I wasn't quite uh, adept to that at first, but the message, which is really what it is, I don't care what church you go to, it's the message. Uh, as long as they're preaching the gospel, it's the message. And the gospel was preached that day. Now, I didn't have this moment where I was invited to like say yes to Jesus at this church, but it was a seed that was planted pretty quickly it grew because it was just a couple hours later that my brother Chris asked me, he said, what do you think about the service that you went to? You know, we were at his house just hanging out on Mother's Day. And I said, uh, you know, the service was a little, little different for me, Chris, a little weird, but uh, I enjoyed the message. It was interesting. And he goes, well, can you come back with me for a second? I said, sure. So we went back to the back bedroom of his house and he introduced me to Jesus. He just said, hey, point blank, can I tell you about the gospel of Jesus? It's been something that's changed my life the last three years. I'd love, for, love to tell you more about it. And I said, yes. Now, my heart was open that day, Alex. And I tell people all the time, I was not one who had studied the Bible. I hadn't gone through seminary. I, I didn't go through all of the classes or whatever it is to be um, you know, certified as a, as a Christian, per se. But my heart was open to say yes when he asked me if I was interested in pursuing a relationship with Jesus. I said, yes. And that started what now is 22 years later, this journey, which is always what I think it is. You know, I don't think anybody ever fully gets it or is, you know, perfectly um, fit to be a Christian. You know, we all sin, you know, Romans 8, 5, 8, I think says all are sinners and fall short of the glory of God. Now, it doesn't mean you have to live in that sin anymore, which is what I believe that once Jesus comes into our life, you know, that's why he went to the cross, that he took care of that sin and paid that penalty for us. But I've been on this journey for 22 years of pursuing God and learning more about him. Um, you mentioned what was that like during my time at ESPN. Well, it was an interesting time because even though I said yes that day on Mother's Day 2001, it took many, many years before I even was able to say God is number one in my life because that wasn't the case for probably a good decade. It was still my job, uh, or it was my wife, or it was my daughter who was born in 2004. It was all of these things, which are all some, in some ways, good things. But if you replace those good things with God, those can actually become bad things. They can become idols, not bad things per se, but idols, false gods, if you will. And so it took me about 10 years till I realized that I was a follower of Christ first before I was an ESPN producer or a husband or a dad. I used to have that backwards. I used to think, you know, I'm an ESPN producer who happens to be a Christian um, or happens to be a follower of Christ. And it was probably in 2012, 13 area where I said, no, you know what? I'm starting to understand now my identity cannot fall into something that's fleeting like ESPN, you know, I thought I would work there forever. Clearly, I don't work there anymore. So my identity couldn't be in that because that's going to end. Uh, it had to be in something, you know, some kind of firm foundation as, as Jesus talks about. I think it's in, you would tell me better, but I think it's in Matthew 5 or Matthew 6 when he talks about putting our firm foundation on solid rock. He's the solid rock. And so that's what I realized. And it's helped me understand that my identity is in Christ first. And, you know, I continued to work at ESPN for a few more years, but ultimately it led me to leaving ESPN and pursuing ministry, pursuing sports ministry, which was something I never even thought about or realized could exist, but that I could combine my passion for sports and my passion for God and help reach people for, for his kingdom. That's just ridiculous when I think about it, you know, many years later, but it's where God has me now and I love it. I think there's something really important, uh, Jason, in what you're saying there, uh, you know, because we, uh, I think whether you're on uh, your side of the Atlantic or on my side of the Atlantic, I think there's a lot of Christians or a lot of people who who, who are intrigued by the message and, and the stories and the gospels, but they, they feel they, unless they go diving, completely mm. diving, then they're in somehow, in some way they're failing, you know, and I, and I, and I and in my context, where I work on uh, some of the urban estates in Lancashire, in 
the northwest of England, uh, who yeah. people listening in the UK will know about. Um, you know, we, we find that people have got um, quite a lot of baggage that they bring with them to the church. And one of those uh, key things that I want to ask you about and, and that I experience is people's um, desire to forgive, but find it difficult to forgive. So they they can yeah. say, yeah, I can I can love Jesus, but I, I've, I've got all this baggage. And you actually wrote a book, didn't you, called Live to Forgive. So can you just share a little bit of that with us, Jason? Just bearing in mind we're, we're up against the clock, but but just you know, a few thoughts there, please, because I think it's really important what you're saying. Yeah, the the key nugget to my book, Live to Forgive, and it's about my story of forgiving my my alcoholic father. Um, I won't go deep into that story for timing purposes, but what I discovered was that I had a lot of baggage, right? And I understood forgiveness from God because I had to ask him, hey, forgive me of my sins. It's right there in the Lord's prayer. You know, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who trespass against us. That second part of the Lord's prayer is very difficult as we forgive those who trespass against us. That is not easy. And I had not forgiven my dad uh, for many years, even though I had asked God to forgive me because I was hanging on to bitterness and anger. I didn't think he deserved to be forgiven uh, for the pain that he had caused me. But what I realized when you search the scriptures that I basically was doing to my dad what ultimately God, if he chose to do, could do to me because I didn't do a lot of things well and I probably didn't deserve forgiveness from God for the mistakes that I made either. But yet he grants that to us freely. He gives it to us if we ask for it. And so who am I to try and play God to my dad and say, you don't deserve forgiveness for what you've done for me. Because forgiveness is not about the other person. Alex, forgiveness is for ourselves. And if we don't forgive, first of all, it's a command from Jesus. Number one, if you're going to be a follower of Christ, we are commanded to forgive every single time that we've been wrong because he does that for us. But the second is, I mean, who am I to play God? My dad and I are the same person in the eyes of God. We're the same person. And I think when I hold on to that bitterness and anger, I'm the one that's trapped in this, this cesspool of, of hate, I think, in some ways that doesn't allow us to be free. I truly what believe that, what did that we do, are free. Jason, when you, uh, because I keep saying to people, you've got to forgive. And it was so hard. But just tell us, you know, in your capacity, in your experience, by letting that go, what, what was the benefit of that for you? What was, what was the consequence? Yeah, it, I always say, you, you're not, it, you know, people tell us all the time, forgive and forget. Well, you never forget. You know, I mean, if we have a brain in our, in our head, we're not going to forget the pain that was caused. But what it allowed me to do was to move forward. That's actually the subtitle of the book, moving forward when those we love hurt us. To forgive means to be able to move forward freely in Christ and understand that, okay, I'm giving this to God. And what it did for me was it allowed me to be free. Alex, it allowed me to walk in freedom, not to necessarily try to reconcile with anyone that's ever wronged me or my dad in this case. Thankfully, we have reconciled, but it's not to be reconciled with, with him. It's to be reconciled to God. And ultimately, forgiving my dad was for me, not for my dad. My dad could have still chose to make those decisions. And unfortunately, recently, he's, he's landed back in some of the stuff that he you know, struggled with for many years, but he's trying and he's trying to get better. But my forgiveness can't be predicated on my dad's actions. Well, I've it's, got to ask you then, Jason, yeah. but is it easy for you to minister to him or to be his son uh, now where you are in your life? Or is it still, you know, I'm sure it's still, a, I'm not even going to ask if it's still a challenge. I, I, I know it, it is, is uh, you know, but, but just, is it different? Hmm. It's very different. I think, First of all, I'm more mature in my age, you know, and I don't look at my dad as somebody who my dad has never been the kind of guy who I look to for advice or guidance or wisdom. Um, he's the one who's always struggled with just trying to stay sober. So I had to learn that on my own or from my mom or from my grandfather. So it is difficult to just be his son yeah. and to let him be my dad. That's that's very difficult for me to this day. Um, but I think it's not difficult for me to to love him and to try and be the best example of Christ. You know, 2 Corinthians says to be an ambassador for Christ when you walk with the Lord. I try to be the best ambassador for Christ that I can be when I talk to my dad. I fail at that 
Sometimes those old feelings come out, but you know, forgiveness is not an instantaneous, you know, thing that just happens. It's a, it's a daily dying to yourself. It's a daily um, request made to God. And I think when we realize that we don't have to, t you know, be so hard on ourselves when we do fail, because we know God is still there. Um, and we know he knows where our hearts are. Yeah, some good wisdom in that, Jason. Thank you. But we are moving on. And I do want to talk about your sports spectrum podcast. So you gave up ESPN and now you, you, well, you've carried on your love of sports because you, you get the, the rich, the powerful, the famous and everybody else. <laughs> Uh, from the sports world just tell us about the podcast yeah sports spectrum is is just a dream really without even realizing it was a dream i mean i get to to work with a media company that tells stories about sports but tells stories about jesus so we're using sports or the athletes and the coaches that we talk to to ultimately hear their jesus story just the way you asked me about my faith i'm asking them about their faith and those are questions those athletes and coaches that i talk to who don't get asked a lot of questions about their faith. That's just not how the mainstream media will ever work. And so we have a very unique space, I think, where we live with Sports Spectrum, where we can have these conversations like you and I are having right now about faith, about sports. And there's a lot of sports in most of my conversations with these athletes, because I'm a sports fan, but there's also a lot of faith. And it's, tell me how Jesus impacted your life. Tell me the struggles. Tell me the, 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 the celebrations, the, the wins that you've had. Uh, and how Christ has allowed you to kind of walk freely in him. And so that's what Sports Spectrum's about. It's been around for a long time, uh, Sports Spectrum, since 1985. Uh, but I'm now part of a team that can stand on the shoulders of others who started before us. And, you know, we look at it as ministry. It's sports ministry, but it's also media. And so we kind of live in two different worlds, but the goal is always the same, and that's to keep Jesus in the sports conversation. And that's what we get to do. I think it's great. I mean, I mean, I mean, I've, I think I've been very fortunate as well with my, my podcast called the, the Godcast is that I, I, yeah. I've managed to have some very famous British people, perhaps not so famous in the, in the States, but some of the most famous people in the country, politicians and have been on. And, and, and before I set it up, I wondered whether people would be open about a conversation about faith because in uh in the uk we're quite conservative to talk about these matters and uh, sure but it turns out that people do people do want to have a conversation and even if they're atheists they've got a view they've got a, a point of view right. and and i and i i'm i i don't even think i need to ask you jason it's a wonderful privilege to to go into a space where the secular world don't, often don't want to travel and have some mm -hmm. really good conversations about religion about faith about philosophy and the meaning of life and, and I get so much pleasure, and I'm sure that's the same for you, Jason. It is. I love talking to people about faith, but not in a way where I'm preaching to them or I'm trying to force my faith on them or I'm trying to convert them, but just talking to people about what they believe. And most of the people I talk to are Christ followers, but I worked at ESPN for 17 years, and most of the people there, many of the people, we're not. And so it allowed me to have conversations then and even now with people that might have differing views. But if we're all very, um, you know, if we do it in a, in a, in a joyful way, in a loving way, uh, I think most people are cordial enough to want to have those conversations if they know they're not, you know, being shouted at or, or you know, forced to, to believe or to, to think about anything. I mean, let's just talk to people and have conversations. I know in the United States right now, this is a struggle just to talk to people who might believe differently or think differently than you, because we all, we automatically label them as the enemy. And it's like, no, this, we're all God's creatures. Like, let's all try to come together and have common ground somewhere and talk through things like this. And I wish there were more conversations. That's why I believe in what we do. And honestly, Alex, I'm really glad in what you're doing. I think that's important to have those conversations with people and, uh, and go a little below the surface, go a little deeper, um, in some of what we talk about. I think that's what I think most people desire, if I'm being honest. Yeah. And 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 where do you see the challenges for the States, Jason, in terms of the Christian faith in, in the UK and, and in much of, of Western Europe? Uh, Christianity is, is, uh, is in decline. We have to be honest yeah. about that. Yep. Um, and it's a, it's a weekly, daily struggle for us to um, tell people, to share, to let, people in let people 
let people give us a window into the life and, and what it's like to be a Christian. Yeah. What, what What's the issues in, in U.S. at the moment? Yeah, I think those those same issues exist. Um, I think, unfortunately, uh, we've seen people use religion or faith or God or even Jesus to benefit themselves or to benefit their political ideology or to benefit their side, which automatically pushes people who might not believe away. And we've seen, you know, the decline in the sort of postmodernism of of secular America happening. But I also have hope too. Um, you know, Jesus said his church is going to go forth and he calls us to make disciples. And I, I have hope. I mean, I love the church body that I'm a part of here in Connecticut. And I see people every day with a hunger and a desire to, to serve God. And I see people who are coming uh, into faith as a new thing for them. And they're not sure where they're going or what they believe. But guess what? I was that guy too, 22 years ago when I was 27 years old. And I think that's wonderful. Like just having, the, like I said, having those conversations, it gives me hope because I think most people deep down have a yearning for something bigger than themselves, for a purpose bigger than themselves. Uh, I think most people default, if you will, to prayer and to, you know, seeking a higher power, if you want to use that word, seeking God when things don't go well. Most people, not everybody. So in that respect, that's where I think we can be a real asset to talk to others about these matters before they have to go into those moments of of deep despair or sadness and you know desperation in many ways so i'm hopeful um there are moments when i'm not and then there are moments when i am uh i try not to pay attention to the political climate or to you know the news because i think it, it often portrays negativity uh and you know the end of the world if you will uh but i think if you go deep down into the roots of people and attend some of these churches and even just talk to some of the people on the street corners i think there's a yearning and a desire for something bigger i really do i, I do too jason has been brilliant talking to you just quickly on uh the yanks are coming to the uk that's for sure in terms of our our national sport which is soccer now I know no. it's not your favorite uh, choice of sport per se, but yeah. but we've we've got some big stars like Tom Tom Brady's just um, invested in Birmingham City and and JJ Watt who who I, to be honest I'd never heard of him but he's yeah. some major soccer American soccer player invested in my own team Burnley. Um, what is what is going on? What is the attraction of British soccer to American superstars? So you're gonna laugh at me when I give you this answer, but I really believe this. Have you seen the show Ted Lasso on Apple? I've heard all about Ted Lasso. And okay. I can't get it on my telly at the moment. I'm okay. to, but yeah, go on. Oh, it's in America. It's, it's on Apple TV here in America. And it's about this country Southern guy going into this English, you know, world and becoming a coach for a soccer team for an, uh, you know, uh, for a football team. And I think a lot of people have watched that show and become really intrigued by the world of soccer, by the world of football and international football. And for me, like I said, I'm, it's not that I'm not a fan. I just don't know the sport. Well, I don't know the players, the athletes really well, but I was intrigued in watching Ted Lasso on how some of these clubs work and the fandom and just, and it's very similar to the States with American football or, you know, American baseball and how clubs are run, but it's a different level of, I think, fandom. And that's what I think. I'm not saying Tom Brady or JJ Watt chose to go into these worlds of soccer because of Ted Lasso, but I do think there became this sort of intrigue that took place in America when we were watching a show like that. And the show does a really good job, I think, of portraying, uh, what it's like to be involved in a soccer club or a football club uh, in the UK. Yeah. It does a really amazing job. And in in, uh, so that, that I think is probably one of the reasons. I also think, you know, I think soccer is becoming more popular in America. Let's just speak it truth. I mean, I, and I think say, and especially with trajectory, you've just got the world's greatest player, Lionel Messi. I when, mean, when Messi comes to America, and now you're starting to see eyeballs on a guy who it would be like if Michael Jordan went to play professionally 
you know, in Europe for, for a year or two when he was at the height of his game or even Tom Brady. Right. So when you get a guy like Messi, Oh my gosh, like that, that speaks to the level. And first of all, he's dominating, he's doing great, which isn't surprising, but that's a lot of eyeballs in our country to watch a sport that has taken a long time uh, to become more mainstream. But I can tell you just from my friends and their kids, like soccer is one of the five now, if you will, you know, he's talking about baseball, basketball, football, hockey in America, soccer is right there. And a lot of these kids are playing soccer uh, and watching guys like Messi. I mean, I have a church family uh, that I go with here in Connecticut that loves soccer. Went to my first professional soccer game a couple months ago here in Hartford uh, with the club here on Hartford, Connecticut. And so that was wonderful for me to experience that and see the level of athleticism, the level of competition, but the fandom, it's wonderful. I love passionate fans. Yeah. Um, but I also am one of those guys now, the older I get, Alex, where I don't want to take sports too seriously because I was that guy and I would let my whole week be in full depression mode if my team lost. Uh, I know that's how it is in the UK with soccer for sure, but I'm a little less, I don't know, I'm still a fan. I still love my teams, but I can't let that ruin my week. I just can't. I have too, too, too many other important things to worry about. I wish that. I could say the same. I mean, I know I shouldn't, but I am a big uh, fan of Burnley. And, and just for people okay. who are listening in America, Burnley have just gone back into the Premier League. So they're in the elite yeah. league now with the Liverpools and the Manchester United. So it's sure. it's exciting times. And the fandom, the, the experience is is fabulous it really is and, and it's an escape for me as well so that's my it's on my bucket list alex one day i want to come to the uk I want, I want to come to the uk just in general i want to go to england i want to go up to liverpool and see where the beatles were i want to do the whole the whole sort of holiday out there but i would love to go to a soccer game or a, a football game you know yeah. in the premier league of some sort and just watch and just experience what fabulous. it's like i would imagine it would be incredible yeah well, Jason, that's a lovely way to end uh, the podcast. Just promote your your wares once more, your your podcast to our listeners, and we'll say goodbye. Yeah, so it's a Sports Spectrum podcast. It's on Apple or Spotify or wherever you want to listen to your podcasts. Um, it's online at sportspectrum.com, which is our website, sportspectrum.com. Uh, and then, you know, there's stories updating every day. There's different devotionals and different features on athletes. Uh, and then I'm on social media. You and I found each other on Twitter X, whatever it's called now, but there in the Twitter world, uh, I'm also on Instagram and love to connect with anybody listening. Fabulous. Jason, it's been great. Uh, for people who might want to catch up on the Godcast, I'm a one-man band, um, although I do have Jesus with me, which is always a, a benefit. And uh, you'll, you'll catch lots of British sports people there, politicians, TV celebs, you name it, they're all there. But Jason, for now, Thanks for your time and thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. I appreciate it.